And so, how do I go to the first slide? Quick uh, preview of what we're going to do today. If you swap display to um, just the slides as opposed to presenter view, there you go. Okay, cool. Okay, quick preview because it's uh, started at the end. Someone's walking and joining us. That's really nice. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I think Zoom can support quite a lot more audio, isn't it? If, do you think uh, Do you think we can unmute and people can comment, or do you want to leave it muted for now? Um, what uh, any, anybody can unmute themselves. Okay. So if you want to if you want to talk, just unmute yourself and talk, and then remute yourself afterwards. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay, good morning everybody. It's Sansi Lo and we will be concluding our last lecture of the series that we've been preparing for COVID readiness. And today I'll be covering cataract surgery and the perioperative care. So there's two parts to the presentation. I would like you to um, be able to understand from the surgeon's point of view, which is part one, when we list for patients for surgery, what risks and benefits are discussed when we get them in clinic, what preoperative assessments are important to do, and actually share with you some cataract surgery videos, because I think that reinforces what you need to look out for after the surgery. And some of you might not have come to cataract surgery theatres before to see it in, in in real life. Um, if any of you feel squeamish at that bit, you might want to take a 10 minute break um, because we'll actually be showing interruptive uh, video presentations. And then the second part is more about what you would be required to know if you're participating in any post-operative cataract assessments for the hospitalized services. First, I'll go through the cataract standards that are required by the Royal College of Ophthalmologists what you need to look out for for post-operative visit, uh, cases, four or five cases, and what you can do. Okay. How do I get to the next slide? Click. Okay. So with all of my COVID talks, or the six, five or six, five, five out of the six lectures that we've provided for you uh, during this period, most of the way I've done my teaching has been focused on making good clinical decisions. Now, clinical decisions are always backed by the evidence. Okay? The evidence base is easily accessible. Things like the OHT, uh, management, POAG, NICE have all these uh, guidelines and publications that you can follow in, in your own learning about clinical scenarios and what to do in particular conditions. But what's important to know is that people don't present with just one thing. And therefore, it's important when you make your final clinical decision and you're delivering your professional standard of care, there are two, uh, two mnemonics that I find particularly useful to help me with managing and thinking about how I want to proceed with a particular patient. Today's lecture is about cataract surgery, and we need to think about respectors respectors for complications, respectors for why they developed cataract in the first place, respectors for positive or negative outcome, like dealing with complications of final visual recovery and rehabilitation. So the two mnemonics that I find particularly useful are ICE, the traditional way of teaching communication skills in medical schools is ideas, concerns, and expectations. So they always ask us to take our clinical history with that in mind to find out what the patient has, um, what ideas they have, what they think cataract surgery is about, what concerns they have, and then dealing with the expectations. And we've always really been taught to undersell and over deliver. You know, that's, that's really the way to make sure that your cataract patient doesn't come with unrealistic expectations of spectacle free, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and then you end up with a good clinical outcome, but a very unhappy patient. 
So there's ICE, ideas, concerns, and expectations. The way I remember it is information, communication, and evaluation. That's over the period that I've been practicing that I found that there is a lot more emphasis from the patients to wanting to know what, what their condition is about. Google is so freely available, so the information is already out there. And there is an expectation for you to provide that and to provide that clearly. And in this day and age as well, the, what we write and what we document uh, can become a, an issue of litigation if there was an adverse outcome. So the clear communication and consistent communication um, also helps. So the final way to make sure that we've done the ICE properly is provide information, communicate it clearly and well, and then evaluate it. So for example, in your clinical notes, you write next visit, uh, check uh, ability to consent, or next visit, check X, Y, or Z. And then your evaluation is when you follow up the patient, you make sure that all the things that you've provided for them has been absorbed. And then you take the whole package, you look at the patient, the eye, and the environment. So if you look at those three things specifically, it will help you not just for cataract surgery, but also for all the various lectures that we've covered earlier in this series. Now, the part one is the, the surgeon's view. For the preoperative assessment, this, these five things at the top are things that I would like as a receiving clinician to know in your referral letter. So I'd like to know their age, race, sex, occupation, driving status. Those are things that are, um, it tells me quite a lot about the patient already and tells me what to aim for. It, it's hidden within those five bits of information. There are risk factor issues, there are social, his, social history issues, and there are perhaps expectation issues, such as a jeweler or a buying arts um, historic um, restorer might have slightly different visual expectations to somebody who is a lorry driver um, and is 48 years old versus 80 years old. So those are five things as a sort of a summary status of who the patient is. And then in terms of providing cataract surgery, Probably with COVID going on, we would not be offering a lot of six, nine cataracts, the Californian cataracts or the, the first eye um, and the patients able to cope. Again, it's dependent on the person status, you know, the, the bit on the top line there. If it is affecting their daily activities, currently there is no limit at our trust. If it's a six, nine cataract or, and even pinholes to six, six and has spectacle correction, but there is a significantly debilitating factor or requirement for surgery, then, then it can still be considered. But perhaps these people um, would be more refractive lens exchange, and that's not, we're talking, that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about symptomatic cataracts that come through to the NHS for surgery. How do we deal with them? So you know a little bit about a patient, you know about their vision, you know about their symptoms. In the referral, I'd like you to write down exactly what's affecting them with, for example, difficulty reading or driving. And then is it binocular or unocular? And you're all very good at documenting refractive errors. And just a few um, things about refractive error that is quite helpful. When patients are myopic and they start developing cataracts, they often get this early myopic shift um, or nucleus scleroidic cataracts have a myopic shift, and that myopic shift helps them to see for, for near. So they'll, they'll first notice the cataract, and then it gets a little bit better because of this low myopia, and then it gets worse again. So in those people who've undergone that process, it is quite possible to offer them monovision, such that one eye is dissociated with the other, and we aim for good distance vision in the dominant eye. For hyperopic patients, to make them myopic is often too big a shift and they prefer to have reading glasses for near. That's a bit of a generalization, but those are the sorts of things we look for when we look at the referral and we, 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 we look at discussing and personalizing the refractive error for the outcome of the patient. And in terms of the ocular history, the significant past ocular history would include strabismus, previous refractive surgery, 
ocular trauma, and that's the eye. And then in, uh, with the patient and the environment, we would want to make sure that they can comply and they have the right type of anesthesia chosen and matched for them. And then at the surgical consult, we also stratify them for risk, the risk of developing a posterior capsule rupture, because that is one of the more significant complications of cataract surgery that might require a second operation or a systolic, chronic systolic macular edema or site-threatening issues such as endophthalmitis. The medical history of the patient is also considered, things like COPD, dementia, uncontrolled hypertension. Hypertension can lead to suprachoroidal hemorrhages, particularly if they're old, frail, and elderly. So we risk stratify all of those things. And just to remember this list easily, just go through the eye, the patient, the environment. Have I optimized all those three of it? Have I gone through my usual process of history taking? And the more you do the thing, um, repeatedly, the more it becomes quite natural to ask all of these issues. And when do we do cataract surgery? Well, this is offered if there is a reasonable chance of improving vision and quality of life. Now, there's a bit of caveats. We do need to make sure that it can be performed safely, and we do need to make sure that there's informed consent. So basically, if we can do operation an operation, in this manner, and the chances of making them better are significantly more than making them worse, then that's sufficiently um, an indication for you to refer to consider surgery. We often get referrals for people who you've observed a cataract on. Sometimes they're even early onset cataracts. But remember, early onset cataracts in younger patients are related to more retinal detachments or more difficulties. The thing you need to press from the history taking is how it's affecting the patient's life. If there is no impact on their life and they've got early oh, Christmas tree cataract, but have had it all their life from childhood and it doesn't bother them, um, we may be just wasting a slot for cataract surgery assessment at the age of 30 when actually they're safer to have the surgery when they're older and give the slot to somebody else who's whose life is significantly impacted by the cataract surgery. So the actual um, difficulty with what they can function with daily, so symptomatic age-related cataracts need to limit their daily function. And they also have to wish to have the surgery or, or we need to have quite a good likelihood that they'll consent and proceed. Otherwise, it's quite an intensive process where we do all the assessments and then at the end of the day, the patient goes, hmm. Didn't know much about it, nah, I think I'll wait. And I, I think at this time point, we need to be quite certain that the referrals that come through are the ones that need surgery so that we can be more efficient in the use of the limited NHS resources that we have. So if the patient is asymptomatic, like some diabetic patients, they might go on and they'll have 618 vision. And for them, that's normal. For them, that's okay. They make their tea, they have a reasonable social life, pre-COVID or post-COVID, and, and the indication was because the diabetic screeners can't get a good photograph. Now, that's a therapeutic indication, and that's also one that we would recommend surgery for. There are other types of cataracts that are not primary age-related with significant other issues that we might have to think about. Things like trauma and retinal detachment repair, might be for the one eye that the eye that had the detachment repair can get the cataract six to 12 months after the RD repair. Sometimes the other eye takes a long while to develop a cataract because that's you know age related. But if the RD was related to a minus eight refractive error and the other eye is minus eight, and the indications for surgery, the refractive part of the assessment becomes much more relevant because a younger person who's minus eight with cataracts only in one eye will have a different and longer discussion than somebody who is 70 years old and routine, normal, age-related cataract. So the other key indication for cataract surgery is for treatment of the drainage angle. You'll now know from the EAGLE trial that angle closure with glaucoma, i.e. pressures over 30, 
with cupping of 0.8 or more, these patients benefit from lens removal for the angle closure glaucoma. Now I've highlighted here the glaucoma because you shouldn't be taking the lenses out for patients who only have early disease that have not had damage at the optic nerve head. This is because smaller eyes and angle closure eyes are particularly difficult to operate on and the risk of complications could be higher for the patients. And you know, if we're doing them anything outside of the glaucoma damage, then we're looking at are they symptomatic cataract patient? Are they post frost biopic symptomatic of the cataract? And there is another reason that you can recommend a surgery because the evidence actually tells us that it's mainly for glaucoma patients and it's not without risk that we can do damage like corneal edema or un further uncontrolled pressure. So the smaller print indications are things like dry age-related macular degeneration where patients already have poor central vision. So in some of these cases, improving their peripheral vision can really help them with getting you know, more use of their, their vision that they do have. So I've put that in brackets because some surgeons wouldn't operate on that, but um, I would always consider it because having a little bit more peripheral vision can be important. And the longevity of patients like Captain Tom, he's going to be 100 tomorrow, and we're gonna have loads more people who are gonna be over 100. So, and, and we probably wanna do their cataracts when they're 80 rather than 95 or even 100, when the risk of difficulty with the zonules and the actual intraoperative risks becomes higher. So contraindication of patients can be determined when you talk to the patient or you make a full professional judgment. If the patient does not desire surgery, then even if you've given lots of information and, and evaluated them and told them this is the best thing for you, it may be because they've, they've heard of a story of their, their close family losing sight or something like that. If there's no way that they're going to want to have surgery, it's a contraindication. Don't do that on a patient because um, uh, we have to match the expectations with the outcomes. So if glasses and visual aids are adequate and you weigh up the risks and benefits, if the risks and benefits are equal, you may want them to come up for an assessment, an independent assessment. It's a nice day up today. Yes. Uh, Chibu, you saying something? Hello, Chibu. Were you about to make a comment? Oh. Okay. I will continue. Anyway, the risks and benefits of the surgery are weighed up. So if glasses and visual aids are adequate and there's not likely, there's not a great likelihood of an improvement of what they already have, then you may not want to refer for surgery. The professional judgment is for you to decide if the potential complications have a more adverse impact on the patient's health and well-being. And other things to consider is if we cannot take away, take, um, do the surgery safely. Um, uh, for example, you know, is your hospital setting that you're referring to able to provide general anesthesia, sedation, or all the other things around the surgery to make it safe and comfortable for the patient? And or if postoperative care cannot be arranged. So the way to evaluate the anterior eye, it's like a cross top to bottom, left to right, and the both lids should be inverted and, and turned up because you'll find surprises in there. And that is the environment of the eye that we need to protect and, and make good so that the post-operative cause will not be oh, um, blighted with blepharitis or dry eye or even worse, end up the mitis. So as you go deeper into the eye, you'll see the Van Herricks, and anyone with less than a quarter of Van Herricks should have a gonioscope done because the gonioscopy is going to inform you whether or not this patient might have angle closure with glaucoma. So if you think they are shallow, take a deeper look and look at the top and the bottom where they often do iridotomies. Sometimes they're downsized uh, on the temporal side now. 
and also for t uh, transillumination because that can tell you of other things like pigment dispersion and it gives you all the various syndromes that can lead to intraocular problems perioperatively. So the anterior segment examination that I do up and down across involves the patient also looking down and then I lift up because you can also find that if they might have gone saying elsewhere or even overseas years ago and had some sort of procedure done and looking at the top to look for space for traps, tubes, etc., and also any evidence of any previous surgery. And then you have the dilated fungal examination and bang on the table to see if the, the lens actually wobbles. If there is PXF material, you'll see the double ring of of deposits of the exfoliation. And, and when you look for the pseudodenesis and it, if the, eyes, the lens is already wobbling in the eye, it, there's a high likelihood that it will not be stable at the time of the surgery operation. And then we counsel them for the need for potential secondary implants or second operation, or uh, also the risk of the glaucoma that is associated with exfoliation syndrome. Now, I talked about angle closure glaucoma as a key <clears throat> indication for cataract surgery. This slide actually shows you the five mechanisms of angle closure. So the, the primary one that gives you acute attacks is what we call pupil block, where the iris actually drapes onto the front of the lens and it builds up with the pressure. And when you do the PI, that gets relieved. It's like this sail where everything is pushing forward. The next two types of angle closure are more atypical and more what you would see in the Afro-Caribbean patients or hereditary angle closure. We've just had um, my key landmark paper published about finding the gene for angle closure glaucoma. It just came out today um, and it's related to plateau iris. So this here is highly hereditary. If somebody has a history of primary angle closure glaucoma, look again for the double hump sign on the plateau, the plateau iris, and the anterior chamber depth can be relatively normal, but the angle is closed. So at your Venharix trigger, if you see something narrow in the periphery, even if the central chamber depth is normal, you should do a gonoscope examination because this for Afro-Caribbean people in particular, um, you will find that, that sometimes the trabecular meshwork is being compressed by the peripheral iris. So these, these types of angle closure, the iridotomy doesn't work quite so well, but by the time they get age-related cataracts, D is the lenticular form of angle closure, where most of the shallowing of the AC has come from the lens. Now with this, they get a dramatic improvement when you do cataract surgery. And that's the one we usually see when people get nucleus chloride cataracts, they're 70 plus, they could have been hypermetropic and they're starting to get early changes in their, their optic disc um, with PACG. So they get a phenomenal response and actually get cured with lens surgery for angle closure glaucoma. And this last one here is retrolenticular angle closure. And this retrolenticular angle closure is also called aqueous misdirection. And the misdirection happens because um, the lens has, sorry, the other way around, aqueous gets shot to the back of the eye in the vitreous, and then the lens keeps pushing forward. It's also called malignant glaucoma because it's particularly difficult to treat. And it often happens after incisional surgery. Retrolenticular angle closure happens after trabeculectomy. And if any patient has ever had a history of surgery and comes to you, probably sort of within the first four months of having had surgery and their vision has changed and their AC is shallow, that's not a normal finding. A shallow AC post-filtration surgery should make you think of retrolenticular angle closure. So this is just sort of a summary of mechanisms of angle closure but I just want you to think about that when you're listing people for surgery, for cataract surgery, you know, where they are on this PACG um, mechanism um, slide. Now, the only way to see angle closure is with gonioscopy, because even with the anterior segment drainage, 
pictures and images, etc., you can't see the pigment and the scarring that's happening inside the drain. So here I have these lacy, lacy processes. Can you see here? They just go over the sclerospur, so they do not cross the sclerospur, and they are very symmetrical and they're very even. And these are actually normal. Compared to this, we can see this this um, wavy stickiness of the iris into the drainage angle. So I think a good anterior segment surgeon or a good cataract surgeon would be very familiar with this, given, <clears throat> given that um, now cataract surgery for PACG is quite mainstream. Um, just remember that pigment and PAS are abnormal. And if you want to learn gonioscopy, it's a subject for another talk and happy to teach it. So um, when the patient is being assessed, we also have to put in the posterior segment documentation. Just looking to see if there's a cataract listing and going straight to surgery would almost be, would, would certainly um, be not sufficient. You have to at least document the disc and macula, uh, optic disc cupping minimum, and also doc document whether you've checked a peripheral retina and looks flat. Okay, I find it helpful to check for PVD because if there is a vitreous detachment and there's a compromise of the posterior capsule during the surgery, there is less of a likelihood that the gel is going to pull on the retina if it's, the PVD hasn't happened yet and it's still intact and you're doing traumatic surgery in the eye. So if it's vis very visible, like a clearly visible Y ring, I usually write that down as part of my clinical assessment before I take the patient to theater. Other investigations should always be at the back of your mind if your vision doesn't pinhole up properly and you think there's just something not right. Remember our previous lectures about thinking about your optic nerve head. If, um, if you think, oh, that looks a little pale or the two discs look different, then you might want to do something simple like color vision or visual field test. And that allows you to make a good assessment or complete assessment of the front and back of the eye. Uh, macular OCT scans are particularly helpful, particularly if you're going to see them again post-op. Documenting it pre-op is what we do for all of our cataracts coming to St. Thomas's and consider having a disc OCT scan too, because a lot of these patients will end up being in the community for the long term. You may have an OCT from just five years ago or like the diabetic eye screening service getting a photo of the disc and we see it 10 years down the line, a very um, slowly progressive glaucomatous change can be definitively diagnosed if you have two time points of photography taken. So even though it's a cataract referral, if you do have this, it's quite useful to have a macular OCT. And then the hospital visit is around planning. So at St. Thomas's, we uh, get the most senior person, i.e. the consultant leads the new cataract surgery referrals. That's because the, the process or the pathway leads to many people looking after the patient and sometimes in shared waiting lists. So patient is listed for surgery but may not meet the first doctor who saw them and goes to different teams and different grades of surgeons. So the first assessment or treatment plan is particularly important because we're assessing not just the eye, but the overall patient, how we're going to deal with both eyes. I showed you this photograph before about the patient here who has a broken nose and an amblyopic dense left cataract with exfoliation syndrome with glaucoma and his only eye and how we went about you know, planning this surgery. And this, this visit with the surgeon also allows us to think about things like toric implants, marking them, fixing astigmatism, and a type of anesthesia. Like I said, as a teaching hospital, we have to make sure the standards are high, and the surgical plan is then followed through. It can change along the way, depending on how the first eye goes, etc. But in a successful cataract journey, the patient is referred from you to us, gets to see a consultant in a clinic, discusses their visual needs, discusses their personal um, expectations. Both eyes, refractive outcome-wise, is discussed and 
provide it with the correct information. They get 48 hours to think about it as a minimum. And then they go on and proceed to have surgery and they understand what the care is. So at the time of surgery, I often tell them that your next visit is with the consultant nurse because the trainees and consultants only really see the ones that have complicated surgery or difficult. And about 95% of our post-ops get seen by a clinical nurse. They used to get a one day phone call, but now everything is shifted to just three weeks post-op. So I'll tell you more about it as we go along. So the patient needs time to think about the consent and the actual idea of informed consent. Yes, Harpreet, do you want to speak? No. Right, Harpreet, have you got a question? So the idea of informed consent is to ensure that the patient wants to have the surgery and with the Montgomery report, it's more, you can give them the information, but if they don't request the surgery, they can turn around and say, well, I, I never wanted it in the first place. So I think a safer way to proceed is if you've given the consent and then the patient can tell you, yes, I would like to have right cataract surgery. So you're documenting a wish to proceed. And that is even stronger. And it allows you then to make sure that all the benefits and the secondary, the benefits of improving vision or possibly with, uh, with the angle of your ones to open the drainage angles are fully understood by the patient. And you go through these risks, which are infection, inflammation, and hemorrhage. In about one in a thousand patients, there's significant sight loss can occur. And ophthalmitis risk is about one in 3,000. One in 20 patients might need additional drops of treatment. So that's sort of the 5% that might have a slightly rocky ride after the surgery. They could develop some cystoid macular edema, um, or um, also about one in 20 patients, three to five, up to five years down the line, could be required to have laser for PCO. When we do the laser for posterior capsule opacification, it can lead to a further complication of retinal detachments as well. So it's just understanding what the patient is going to, um, to expect and to go through and, and give them a very personalized consent form for all the additional clinical findings that we have picked up in the surgery, um, pre-op assessment, for example, if we think there's a risk of chronic uveitis or posterior polar cataracts, these are, these are hereditary and, and are associated with 25% risk of complications. So it's important to, to make sure that it's personalized for the particular patient as well as getting their wish to proceed. This is not really a risk, the need for reading glasses, but often not discussed with the patient and they can get surprised and they have perfect 6665 distance vision and, and not realize that they needed glasses for reading and setting the expectations up properly. Okay, so the surgery really is um, to be done under optimized conditions. Make sure that things like blepharitis are managed prior to the surgery and, and make sure the environment is the best such that the patient can adhere. So FACO is now the standard procedure for IOL implants. And this year, actually, we're celebrating 70 years of modern cataract surgery um, at St. Thomas's because the very first intraocular lens implant in the world was developed by Sir Harold Ridley, who was a consultant surgeon at St. Thomas's. I'm sort of the grand surgeon, I guess, the, the third or fourth generation of cataract surgeons at St. Thomas's. So this is something we're really proud to celebrate. And it's 70 years this year. I'll just play this for you. surgery can be squeamish to onlookers, but in 1950 it was a high-risk operation on the tape of pioneers. This is a cartridge that contains the intraocular lens implant. 
Today, after 70 years, it is a routine procedure for Dr. Lowe, who continues the vision of its inventor, Sir Howard Ridley, who also worked right here at St. Thomas's Hospital. How are those long range? It would have to involve a very large incision to open the eye up sufficiently in order for the lens to come out of the eye. And then oh, someone just spelt wrong. The risk of that was significant bleeding, trauma to all the tissues of the eyes, retinal detachment, and significant risk to blindness. And um, before the operation was there, they were in your mind. I was very confident that I had to so I knew what to expect. Jane's peace of mind is thanks to pioneers like Jeffrey. When he was 16 years old, he was one of Sir Ridley's first cataract surgery patients. One of the consultants you saw here, my wife, uh, were talking about it. He said basically that we've got to look at the question of pioneer. He said what they did to you is practically brutal compared to what they do now. But he, he said it was um, what, what they could do at the time. This is what they've done from you. He's learned how to do it now and now, so it's a wonderful progress in all the time. The consultants at St. Thomas's Hospital stand in the middle of history, inspired by the past and motivated to help even more patients in the future. How inspiring is it to see Jeffrey? Absolutely inspiring. To see the work that we continue to do for patients every day, it's like getting 100% and that's gives you a real wonder and drive to go, wow. Let's do it and let's make the best of it. And on top of all of that, you're helping people. So Ridley's pioneering treatment has enabled millions of people around the world to have their sight restored, all thanks to his unwavering vision for the future of ophthalmology. Antoine Allen, ITV News. Did any of you know about this history about St. Thomas's and the intraocular lens implant? Yes, I've, I've seen the plaque in, in, in the clinic as you walk in the corridor. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Yes. So, yeah, so that serves as a little break. Um, and then we'll go on to actually show you the surgery. So this here is a corneal incision. Um, not the incision, but the actual relaxing incision for the treatment of astigmatism called a limbal relaxing incision. So all of this is pre-planned. So as a refractive cataract surgeon, our aim is to get as close to zero as possible, or as close to zero uh, cataract, um, not cataract, let, spectacle independence as possible at the time of surgery, depending on their visual demands and their refractive aim. The incision itself is three steps to be self-sealing, so we don't do the, um, so we don't need a suture because sutures, if they're not removed, can cause problems as well, like infections, etc., erosion. And the clear corneal incisions can be coupled with this that I'm showing here, which is the Oki opposite clear corneal incision or limbal relaxing incision to treat astigmatism. And when we do surgery, one of the difficulties or the challenges is when we have patients with small pupils. It contributes to sur difficulty during surgery. And this here is showing you some iris hooks. Once you have the pupil widely dilated, the next or probably the most critical step of the cataract operation is this part, which we call the curvilinear, con continuous curvilinear uh, capsulorexis. Continuous because you have to have it join up perfectly so it's strong and it doesn't tear. This is an insulin needle bent at its edge and inside the insulin needle I've got a little bit of viscoelastic gel to keep it all nice and formed so that I can control this. And when they talk about femtosecond cataract surgery, it is this particular step that the femtosecond laser cuts. It cuts a perfect circle in the middle and so that we can reach to access the cataract. And this step I'm doing now is is flushing with a little gentle hydration of, of balanced salt solution in order to lift the cataract to make sure that it can spin in its capsular bag and make sure that um, I will be able to remove the cataract intact and safely and keep the original membrane of the posterior capsule intact. If patients are on tamsulosin, it's a key clinical medical history factor to take into account because it often leads to tricky surgery or 
trauma complications and what we call intraoperative flocky iris syndrome, IFIS, that was described around 2005 or 2006. And then the phaco emulsification bit is uh, pioneered by an American ophthalmologist in, 19, in the 1970s. And it was a visit to his dentist uh, that he realized that a ultrasound probe was being used to polish his molars and didn't damage his gum. And that led to the further research to develop this into, uh, I guess, a multi-billion industry to remove lens, um, lenses for the cure of cataracts. And combined with Harold Ridley's innovation with the intraocular lens, these two parts of the operation, the FACO plus the lens removal, is now standard cataract surgery. So this here is dividing the lens into a couple of pieces or four pieces, which is what we call the divide and conquer technique, where we take the quadrants out one by one and keep the lens steady and stable throughout the procedure. So the ultrasound probe actually has an irrigating fluid and it's, it floats everything within the eye to replace the aqueous that's in the eye and at the same time has this vacuum to suck the lens towards us and it allows us to keep the rest of the bag completely intact so as to um, put the new implant in its most original state. So here, after the lens is removed, you see all these fibers and little material out here. This is called soft lens matter. If this is not done properly or well, then you can have alchemic pearls that are around the side. Sometimes you see these white pearly stuff after people have had cataract surgery. It's at this step that the clearance was not adequate. Or um, also at this step, if it's been a difficult operation, sometimes the surgeon goes, ah, that was done. And at this stage, it's still also possible to break the posterior capsule. I'll show you the polishing that goes on for this lens matter removal. So this is called a bimanual technique where I have fluid irrigating in one hand, just pushing on the main wound to make sure that there are no fragments or anything that wish to come out. So we need to grasp this material with this irrigator or the, um, the suction side of the bimanual um, procedure. And there was a pause there. That's for me to teach the trainees that when you pick up the lens material, that's one step. And then when you remove and you, you suck it into the eye, that's the step where the posterior capsule can ping up and catch the lens, catch your instrument and cause a posterior capsule rupture. So that, that video was prepared to show the trainees what to do and this whole procedure goes around 360 degrees. So after that's fully cleared, you have this really nice rexus. We've got, um, um, I'm proud of my nice brown rexus. As good as frontal lasers as what I aim for. And it's this little thing here, but you know, very good strong rexus, good size. And, and the implant is then positioned into the bag, folded up with a lens injector and then put into position. So at any stage, the posterior capsule can be ruptured during the operation, which is why it's one of the key sort of numeric outcome measures that everybody always measures, somebody's posterior capsule rupture rate. Um, and there are some national standards to that. So at this stage, we're just removing all the gels that we use to help sustain the anterior chamber during the surgery and also position it maximally and beautifully in the center of the lens bag because otherwise you can have little shadows that patients can then complain of of a little dark arc um, that they see in the early stages post-operatively and uh, that usually settles. But the lens position and getting it centered and in the perfect 100% place, I guess, um, is, is very satisfying and also very important for visual outcomes. This last two bits is injecting some 
antibiotics, cefiroxine, to prevent infections. Then we check the intraocular pressure and leave it physiologically normal at the end of the procedure. And this whole thing probably takes about half an hour uh, turnaround from the time the patient comes into theater, do the surgery and leave. The surgery itself can only sometimes only take 10 or 13 minutes depending on the difficulty of the case and how well the scrub nurse and the surgeon know one another, whether they're almost telepathic and works like a machine. But you can tell the patients their expectation is approximately half an hour to 45 minutes. If, for example, they have a trainee surgeon. Okay, so, so the second part is more relevant to you about the optometrists and what you would be looking for. And the National Cataract Standards are published and known to, um, to all departments across the UK where we collect now our complication data and pool all our electronic medical records. They come from these publications to give us the standards that we need to aim for. And 95% of all cataract surgery, uh, phaco emulsification with IOL worldwide is performed without complication and achieves improvement in vision. So statistically, the plus or minus 5% is really, this is almost as close to the perfect operation for medical condition that you can get over the period of time, over the last 70 years since Sir Harold Ridley invented the implant all the way to what we do now today in a sometimes 13 to 45 minute procedure, you see. So we constantly improving the national standards for posterior rupture, perhaps a rupture are about 2%. And that's what our senior trainees um, are monitored on by the time they qualify to become consultant surgeons in the UK. And the post-operative visual outcomes are expected to be at 6, 12 or better in more than 99% of eyes. And about half of these patients should see 6, 6 or better. That's the national standard. The per-operative complications are less than 5%, kind of what we were expecting. And in that publication, the Jacob one, it says post-operative complications occur in less than 30% of cases. Now, 30% seems quite high, but I think that also includes things like PCO that end up with lasers, um, et cetera, and PCO is probably counted as a late complication as well, because um, that can have its own problems. And 95% of eyes should be within one doctor of the refractive aim. Okay, so those are the standards. And if you were to see our patients from the hospital directly in your clinics for the post-op visit, these key data have to be collected and you'll be given links to open eyes or whatever electronic medical records are important for extracting this data. And part of the consultation will be putting in refractive outcomes, visual outcomes, complication outcomes, if known. Things like anterior uveitis post-op or cystoid macular edema post-op that you see in the post-operative visit. Now, like I said, the visits have now shrunken down to only one, generally one visit for NHS patients. And this is typically done at three weeks, but CMO can happen up to four, six, eight, four to, the peak time is, some, is sort of between four to six weeks after the, uh, the time of the cataract surgery. So they will only be sent to your practice for follow-up cataract visit if it was uncomplicated, unless there's been admin error or, or something like that. They, it should be uncomplicated. Now the history taking will, will is most important if for each of these visits, so that um, the you can evaluate if the patient expectations have been met. If the vision is less than 612, we always do a macular OCT. And actually, in practice, the majority of all our patients get macular OCTs done at their post op visits. They get an auto refraction at the hospital, but you may be providing them with the manifest refraction. Um, the final refraction will probably be the, the visit after the three week one because you want them to be off all their steroids, off the whole period where there's a risk of CMO, and then give them their spectacles. Um, the intraoperative check, IOP check, should be done with the Goldsman, ideally. And then the, the fundus 
has to be dilated to to look for um, uh, cystic macular peripheral retinal detachments. Look at the vitreous. The vitreous should not have any pigment on it, and and not have any cells, and everything limited to the front chamber. Look at the position of the lens implant. How I've showed you what we do in the surgery. That's what you should see three weeks later, but with the with the vision outcome as well as um, the recovery. The standard regime for most of our teaching hospital cases, if there are um, Afro-Caribbean, dark RDs, or significant likelihood of chronic inflammation, then they get quite a lot of Maxidex in the first week, six times a day for one week, and then four times a day for three weeks. I'm not a fan of going four, three, two, one, the tapering dose, because half the time it goes down the cheek and doesn't go into the eye. And um, it's easier for the patient to have had the full, full course of four times, a minimum of four times a day for a whole month of the Maxidex dexamethasone eye drops. So Maxidex is given, sometimes preserved to three dropper dex. And if the patient has had other risk factors, such as the risk of cystic macular edema from diabetes, they also get Nevenac eye drops. Uh, or if they have smaller eyes and any additional risk of, of CMO, they also get started on Nevenac. Chloramphenicol is given for prophylaxis. They only need to take that for one week. Um, if there's significant blepharitis, moxifloxacin or something that kills the bacteria is prescribed because chloramphenicol is only bacteriostatic, which means it stops the doubling of the bacteria um, using chloramphenicol, but it doesn't kill what's there, whereas moxifloxacin is a bactericidal antibiotic. So if you're worried, um, the, the surgeon may be prescribing blepharitis if that's flagged and you know, uh, the preoperative assessment continues on and the management is adhered to, adhered to. If the pressure is already high during or before the surgery, we usually give a dose of iopidine at the end of the procedure and to prevent aqueous misdirection, which was the, you know, um, that last picture I showed you on angle closure mechanisms, we give some atropine on the table. We don't usually give it more than that because the key thing is maintaining the anterior chamber during the surgery. Then you don't get these other complications. It's doing the safe surgery, safe surgery, not not um, nothing here all week. Yeah, it's twenty minutes for us, but it's a lot of time for the patient. So if the pressure has already been high, we give Diamox for three days. We check for things like renal inability to take Diamox, et cetera. Uh, so make sure there's no contraindication to that. And when patients need district nursing, they only can come in twice a day. So the prescription that goes home with the district nurses would be some antibiotic with, um, with some steroid. But because it's only twice a day, I give an ointment to make sure that it lasts a little bit longer. They already get cefiroxime in the surgery. So maxitrol ointment is used twice a day. Now there's a, there's a reference here to Emily Cabone's paper because at Moorfields Eye Hospital, they discovered that patients that were using maxitrol eye drops that have the back preservative in it, the neomycin of the maxitrol was reacting with things like acular and other NSAIDs. When those two come in combination, they've even had patients with severe corneal melting disease. So maxitrol and NSAIDs must never be prescribed together for a long-term um, treatment for post-operative anterior segment surgery. Maxitrol ointment is a slightly different preservative, so I believe that that would probably be safer. Um, and we can also always change it to betanazole, but it's nice to have a bit of the antibiotic component to it. So patients go home with press free dexamethasone, so there's no back, Nevenac and Maxitrol. Each one of this drop is put in the time the patient, the, the district nurse attends. She'll put in the um, dropper dex first, and then a Nevenac, and then the Maxitrol to sort of cream and cover it over. Each of those drops, drop, drop ointment, is done five minutes apart, and then later on in the day, the district nurse will come again to do exactly the same thing. Dex Nevenac and Maxitrol. And that in general has been fine for all my patients that have had dementia or need 
district nursing care or have such severe arthritis, they can't do the drops by themselves. So we're very lucky here in the UK that we've got um, such good social care that these people can still have treatments for their dense cataracts. And if they can't do their post-op regime, we look after it for them. So when you do your post-op check in your optometry practice, I find it useful to start from the back to the front. So you, ha you have a quick look first, look for a round, totally round pupil before you dilate, because if there's any vitreous anywhere, the, the pupil will not be regular. Okay, have a quick look, nice and round, nice and regular, how much inflammation, and then put in the drop to dilate them. When you've dilated them, check the peripheral fundus, check the, there's no cells in the vitreous, and then look at the back chamber where you normally see the PCO. Look where the lens implant is sitting. And here's an example in the right eye, the patient has had what we call anterior capsule phimosis, which is kind of growing or the clouding of the lens over the front part of the capsule where it's opened up with this perfect circle. And on the other side here, the lens is actually tilted and it's tilted forward with this secondary posterior capsule clouding over because it's not healing in the correct plane. And the outcome has now shown you, like this is 6.5 in the first eye and the second eye had a surprise at 6.12 and this was a terribly unhappy patient. And she blames it on the fact that it was not a consultant who did the operation. And so because we have a big team of surgeons, we always counsel or grade for sort of our low, our, our least um, mature students, surgeons would be ST3 or above. So all our risk complication calculations, etc., are based on the surgery being performed by a year three registrar. And then we counsel appropriately to the patients to tell them what difficulties they might, they might encounter. The evaluation of the anterior chamber is for you to look at the front to examine for things, including the iris. For example, here, if there's transillumination, this was actually a case where the lens implant was rotated into the eye, but the pupil was terribly small. So it couldn't, this, this was what, one of my learning cases when I, when I was a registrar. And I put the lens implant in and then the post-op visit, um, it was observed that there was some transillumination by the fellow. And then the fellow then went back and to theatres, put an iris hook in and saw that this implant was tilted and put it back into the original position and the patient had a fantastic outcome after that. So it's looking at the things um, like we talked about, the angle closure uh, could have deep irises, the, the PXF, the exfoliation material sometimes is not even visible after you've had the cataract surgery, but you need to know that was their primary mechanism. So they still get monitored for glaucoma because exfoliation syndrome is a very, very common cause for open angle glaucoma. So I'm only showing this video because we're going from back to front. We look at the lens, we look at the AC, and I'm showing this video, just a front bit of it, to show you how we give the anesthetic in in injection. So this is an eye with exfoliation syndrome. And because it's more tricky, you'll notice that lady that was on telly, she, uh, she, she only had drops to numb her eye. Here is the little opening in the conjunctiva. So if you see the patient quite early after surgery, a week after surgery, let's say, you might still see a little red area there in the inferior nasal conch because that's where we've given the subtenons injection. And this is the clip. It's important that the surgical field is clear and clean. And, and here you can see those deposits all around there for exfoliation syndrome, exfoliation glaucoma. It just increases the risk of complications in, um, in surgery. In this case was uncomplicated. I'm just going to show you this bit with the subtenons and the blue bit just dyes the front of the front of the lens material and uh, it's not always necessary, but for things like exfoliation syndrome, where it can be stuck and you can't open the whole circular rexus properly, it's quite useful to have that stained. Okay, complications of cataract surgery. The most, most, most important thing is honesty. Telling them exactly what happened. Documenting clearly in the notes. 
not talking in the surgery unnecessarily saying oops or um, you know patients are awake you saw that video on on the ITV video they they had to consent and know that she was going to be on national TV <laughs> and 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 understand what they're supposed to to hear or or feel at the time when you touch them to put the drapes on etc and if that's been a problem they often know it's because the atmosphere in the theater could be more tense the nurses the sound of the vitrectomy machine if the posterior capsule has gone so important at the very first opportunity to tell them that there has been a complication of surgery if it happened during the surgery so the things that happen during surgery are our posterior capsule ruptures, supracranial hemorrhages, lens damage, iris damage, um, and then the speculum itself can give ptosis, which is a later thing that they complain of, probably at the visit when they see you. Sometimes they get better, sometimes it's permanent. It's, it's ad admitting that it is part of the surgery. Then if you go, no, the surgery is perfect, complicated, now uncomplicated, your lid is fine, it's just age. It doesn't reassure the patient. It's really to uh, set the expectation that they can expect your for you to inform them if anything goes wrong. Okay, so refractive surprises probably the first thing you'll pick up being experts at refraction data, and we we have to consider ocular biometry for these refractions, and and then prolonged inflammation is what we often. Um, see at the three week follow up visit. So, having IP is quite useful to repeat the prescriptions for them, or sometimes giving a bit of Nevenex so they don't get a steroid response. The IOP check is important because Maxidex can cause a steroid response in some people. And then you can do a macular OCT scan. And then a lot of people will complain of dry eye or peripheral. If there's lots of peripheral, just, just press here to make sure that there's no goo. Or or infectious components around the nasolacrimal sac and then give them the advice about nephritis. Sometimes people with latent squints get decompensated. So in your referral letter, if you have already prescribed them with a small prism before in the past, it's quite useful for us to know that. So it's nice if you can include that in your letters. I'm gonna show you a few cases of the outcomes. This, this was a lady on national TV. She had retinal detachment 10 years ago done by us at St. Thomas's and then had a intraocular lens implant put in and was 6.5 in the cataract eye. And then uh, she presented 10 years now with very dense to over 60 cataract and uh, she pinholed to 6.9 so I was anticipating that it would be fine even though she's youngish, 62 years old and she got a 6.5 outcome with N6 unaided. So this is spectacle free from somebody who had a risk of retinal detachment. That just shows the standards that we're, we're aiming to get. She's 6'5 with N6. You remember this eye was 6'5 in the right eye. And after this one got better, this one became 6'6. Um, there's still some astigmatism left in her, in her with the rule, astigmatism, but this is actually quite helpful for reading. So it, in some cases, it's not necessary to completely eradicate the astigmatism at the time of surgery. It's something I always think about, though, because it's a missed opportunity. Otherwise, it's a few, I don't know, a minute more of my time to get a big benefit for the patients. So biometry is actually the measurements of the eye that help us to calculate and personalize the lens implants. So this is a printout, and every patient has to do this, and biometry it's getting more and more and more accurate because of the various formulae that we use to calculate it. And the fact that there's big data and millions of patients have had cataract surgery, we now have precision up to 95% in being able to predict what we can give the patient. So if you look here, I was aiming for 0.25, 0.26, and she got a 0.25 outcome with a sill of minus 1.50, which was already pre-existing because she had a um, you know, a plus in the vertical meridian 1.61. So, uh, so the, the outcome was fabulous. The second case here is a 48 year old male. So these four cases were from like one, one post-op clinic that I saw. Um, not, not everybody comes back to, to see the consultant for post-op visit, but some of the cases do. 
for example, this gentleman was referred to me because he'd already had retinal detachment not long ago. He's only 48. So the younger patients, because they, they have to live with it for 50 plus years, um, it's advisable that, that a, a fairly senior, senior surgeon does their operation. He developed a 660 cataract within a year of having uh, a vitrectomy, vitrectomy a year ago. He didn't have the IOL, sorry, at the time. How, and after the surgery, he got 66 with a tiny little bit of cylinder again in the same direction. And if you look at the refractive outcome, this is spherical equivalent amitropia, and we aimed for minus 0 0.31. Okay. Post vitrectomy eyes can be harder to, the really long eyes and really short eyes can be harder to predict the refractive outcome. A typical male will have a 23.5 millimeter length eye. This here is nearly 26. So once it goes over 26, the risk of complications is higher. And this picture I'm bringing up here is, is what I want to show you with the lens touch. So you see this scar at the back of the, the posterior capsule. Uh, it's easier to see on proper slit line, but there's a diagonal line. And that's actually the instrumentation that when they do the vitrectomy surgery, that instrument had actually touched the back of the lens in this case. So it is quite possible and quite easy to split that weakness at the time of surgery if caution is not taken to, to deal with this to make sure we don't get interruptive complications. It was not possible to remove the opacity completely because it was part of this weakness from the lens touch, but nonetheless, he still got a fantastic outcome at 6.6. And then this is case three, an 82-year-old uh, gentleman with no English. So in your referral letter, if you need an interpreter, let us know beforehand. Otherwise, they sometimes come in not knowing what they're there for, no interpreter, and it wastes an outpatient visit. So I think this one was, I can't remember, Spanish, Italian? But we arranged an interpreter, and, and his vision did not get better than 612 pinhole and six, this pinhole got worse, so maximum was 618. So given that, I asked for a color vision test and indeed it was reduced, 10 out of 13 and eight out of 13. Maybe it's a limited English, maybe not. So I made a plan. Remember I said to do your communication, sorry, your information for the patient with an interpreter, communication to the patient to say, mm, I'm not sure, I want to do a few more tests. Even though that's not routine, we usually just do pre-op visit, list for surgery, see a nurse, the nurse list for surgery, see a consultant, do the surgery, discharge. So we usually have a five-step pathway. He had an extra visit. Now this extra visit was because his PC rupture rate was high. He's quite likely to have significant complications, five to six times more having a difficult operation. Small pupils might need hooks. So I've written my surgical plan here. I've also noticed that his discs were a little bit crowded and his color vision was poor. So I wanted to check his color vision again and do his visual fields. And this is what we found. That was his visual field. So there are a number of reasons you can have that. You could have space of time lesion. You could have uh, a stroke. You could have uh, non-ischemic arteritic um, optic neuropathy on this side. Or you, um, you know, the, you could even have glaucoma, but we had a point one disc. So can you see that that visual fields and the neural eye lecture that I gave you last week is totally relevant and totally what I practice. And this patient could have just gone to anywhere and not been picked up that his color vision was reduced and had the surgery and then will come back and say, you know, I can't see, I can't see well. And if you never check the field, you'll be going, nah, of course you can see you've got 6'6", six, six, you've got 6'9 vision. We know that vision is a much more complex procedure and it's really nice when we can pick it up. And then now, you know, he's got a stroke, right? Can you see after the surgery, the rest of the contributions of the lens opacity um, changes have been removed and he's got a completely congruent homonymous hemianopia and that's related to a previous CVA. So you, you know that. And also the counseling is precise and personalized 
And I told him about the potential guard at prognosis because we've picked up a visual field defect. So that extra visit was particularly important for him. Now I said that small eyes are harder to difficult, harder to predict. So normally a typical male eye is 23 millimeters and this is 22.71. And under 22 millimeters, um, the formula changes. So there are a few things that the surgeons have to be particularly um, slightly OCD and 100% of that to make sure that we get consistently our 95% plus outcomes. So you see here in this first, time, first eye that I did, I aimed for a minus 0.14 outcome. Yeah. However, because it's a small eye, I actually got a plus eight. No, sorry, not plus eight, luckily. Plus 0.8. Yeah, it's still well within the plus or minus one doctor of my refractive aim. Um, how, and he was 6'9", and he's good. And in terms of his visual field improvement as well, his cataract improvement. And then, um, and then that the other eye, because I got a plus outcome in the left eye, I went slightly minus with a half diopter on, um, on see the minus 0 0.57 lens was selected. Unfortunately, I didn't get a refractive um, printout, but if this person had seen by yourselves in the community, then we'd have very robust data for refraction. So that's something we're looking forward to. And then now here is the last case which was actually a glaucoma patient who was already pseudophagic and had a cystic avascular trap and is already 85 years old. Luckily, her, her cataracts, not her cataracts, her glaucoma was very asymmetrical. And so she, she had actually normal tension disease where left eyes tend to be more affected. Um, we think it's the aorta. Um, the, the right side hadn't progressed yet but the pressure was higher and she was on latanoprost and had some pigment across, you know, slightly darkening of the right side. So my aim was to try and get her drop free and also spectacle wise to give her the best distance vision because um, after discussing the refractive expectations and one of the things that we do sometimes do is combine surgery with cataract plus diode surgery or cataract with I stent surgery, and then these are all the five routes where we can do surgery to, to fix glaucoma. And, and for this patient, I selected her to have this I stent surgery. So the surgery is the same as I've shown you with cataracts procedure. And then putting a gonioscope on, we're looking for the trabecular meshwork and looking for the pigmented line and the sclerospur above it. And um, sorry, the pigmented ciliary body, and then there's some trabecular meshwork pigment. So the aim is to get into trabecular meshwork. With this, it's like a little blade um, with a slider, and then you have to slide out the tiny little implant, which is actually only the size of a full stop on a piece of paper. So it's super high magnification, slightly rotated around so that I can see the tips and show up the tiny little um, tiny tiny little implant at the edge of that there's a bit of a learning curve there this was some this was one of my earlier cases but um, Del shows this quite well in inserting it it can be very straightforward or a bit of a faff because you can't see or the positioning is not right it's, it's just particularly important to get it absolutely perfect from from the entire planning to totally uncomplicated, beautiful cataract surgery, and then making sure that you're in the right place. The bleeding actually tells me I'm inside retinal mesh. I'm I've inserted it in the correct place, and then I'm looking again with a bit more viscoelastic to examine the position of the stents. So the main risk of this is bleeding at the time of surgery. So the first few cases, there were um, uh, I removed the removed the jelly with the viscoelastic, not on direct visualization, and that's tweaking the technique a little bit. Can you see there? I'm just making it making sure that the the tiny little implant is in an excellent position, pushing it out a bit so that it's proud, and then taking out the gel that's supporting 
the viscoelastic gel is removed with this bimanual technique again. And then the rest of it is like routine. It's like the recovery is like a normal cataract operation. Uh, I would check the pressure either later on that afternoon or the next morning, and then they get a three week follow up. So you see here, the, the eye is still tilted to the side because I want to see that I've removed all the blood. Normally we would turn it straight to remove the blood, but this I found has been particularly good and we've not had any cases where the blood has clotted inside the angle and kept the pressure up. And so she got 6.6 six with IOP of 12. The lens, uh, the gonio lens is put back on to look at the, the eye stent position. So the time of cataract surgery, and you can see here, it looks just like a regular ordinary cataract operation because the implant can be done in a rather atraumatic way if you know the angle very well. So the last thing is to summarize for you, the decision for cataract surgery, all of these, so if, if there's one page uh, of things to think about, this is it. Um, the patients will probably have these common questions. Is it painful? That's when you talk about the local subtenons and topical anesthesia options. More than 90% of my cases are topical anesthesia and the tricky ones get the subtenons, maybe 10%, and then very rarely we go to GA. Um, or sedation and I would prefer GA to sedation because in a sedation case they're sort of drowsy and they can suddenly wake up from the operation whereas in the GA you just completely take over do a quick operation and then wake them up it's probably better so they will ask about how to keep the eyes open so at least you've seen the surgery we put the speculums in how long does it take I've covered that and will you be awake and when I see the operation, they worry about seeing the needles. How long does the recovery take? Typically, I tell them it's four weeks until all their drops are finished. Okay, that's, and also, typically, that's when we discharge to you guys at about six to eight weeks. And then they'll ask about hospitalization. It's been decades since we've needed to keep patients in hospital for cataract surgery. They'll ask about blinding conditions. And, and what if I don't have the operation? They always have a choice. Where the cataract grow back is the PCO thing. So what you can do is use those two things that I've, I've armed you with. You know, always consider the patient, the eye, and the environment. Under environment could be things like COVID, could be things like uh, complex social history, anything. If you have those three as your key groups to think about and you've considered the options, then you've pretty much covered most areas. And then always provide this ice ask them what their concerns and expectations are, and then make sure you've given the information, you've given them the communication that is clear in your letter and your referral, and, and then go back to re-examine that to make sure that you know, um, your clinical outcomes are excellent. So this is important for professional development. I think uh, it's been a fantastic opportunity for us being able to work with you guys, Max. And actually, Faisal has given me refractive outcome uh, advice, isn't it? We've actually talked about patients and what we can do with monovision and pressure control and shared care, etc. So it's been fabulous. And, and it is also an opportunity for us to shape cataract surgery post-COVID. I'm not sure we'll be doing 12 cases in a day anymore on, um, because now we're doing three a day because of the full PPE. Etc. It's just taking so much longer to do the surgery. We're only doing this people that really urgently need it and are compromised by their significant bilateral cataracts. Um, and we do do them in the waiting list order. If you would like to help, I was like hoping to produce a cataract information leaflet. And it might be quite nice as a MEX community that you guys come up with one that you want to share at a max um, when people come to book with you for a cataract or max referral and you might find a cataract. So this is an example of um, a course that I did with a group of colleagues. We were all in training at the time of fellowship and we put together um, a free course that people can log in. We put it on in 2014 and I kind of forgot about it. And then recently someone, um, it triggered um, my attention was triggered again I went and looked at it and there have been 2,600 patients have gone on to this Udemy course to to look at I know glaucoma 
So this is Huma Shahid, who is a consultant now at Cambridge. So I was thinking something like that, that we could set out as a little group, think about the topics we want to tell the patients, what to expect if you have cataracts, give them the information, give them a, a link that their family member can go on to and do this cataract course before they come into the hospital, etc. So if anybody wants to participate, I know Pratesh is fantastic at IT. So I think as a group, you've got the expertise where we can get something like that out there and it will be another real win for South East London, the award-winning MEX scheme to come up with, to future-proof our consent-taking process in the community. And the last thing is to say um, is to keep interested, keep participating. Thank you for coming on to my, my training lectures and get interested in your learning. For us, it's continuous. Wet labs cataract pathway meetings, pre-assessment, every single part of the process is totally examined, totally learned and relearned to get it the way we have it and continuously getting better. These are the references that have been in the paper. And after this, I'd like to send you two SurveyMonkey um, feedback if you don't mind filling them in to, and spread it amongst your colleagues. Uh, one, to find out how you got on with the lectures, whether you um, what particular things you found helpful, etc. And also the second one, your views on cataract surgery referral. You know, what, what have you observed so far? How can we make it better? How can we make shared care better? You've got my email address already, and that's the NHS Rainbow. Thank you. And behind every single successful cataract operation is a team of about 10 people. <laughs> that's 10 to 1, you know. That's my trainee, uh, she's now at King's. And that's the patient having um, biometry with the IOL master. It's like the Mercedes Benz, fantastic, so super accurate. This is Swapsos OCT based. These two are our pre assessment nurses, and very important to keep them happy. And of course, my lovely little family. Hi, Sandy. Well, Thank you so much for your talk. I've just unmuted it. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, just in the chat, there's been a couple of questions. I wonder if you'd be able to answer them. Okay, yeah. So one question um, written quite early on when we were talking about narrow angles. Yeah. What percentage of referrals of narrow angles sent to you for assessment do not end up with surgery? Um, so, they, so narrow angles comprise of about a third of my clinical workload. Mm -hmm. And uh, so respectively, it comprises about 30% of the cataract surgeries that I do as well, okay. because it kind of translates from the outpatient into the surgery. Mm -hmm. However, um, if they don't have high pressures with visually significant cataracts, they, um, they don't always get surgery they only get surgery if they have glaucomatous change or their iop is completely difficult to control so i still do laser iridotomies if they are um you know pre presbyopic sometimes just because of my research interest i get the hereditary ones so i get the you know 20 something hyperopic patient where actually there's no glaucoma so you can't take the lenses out plus you're going to make them immediately lose their accommodation and they might have a bit of pupil block which is this screen here so the correct treatment for pupil block angle closure is laser iridotomy so probably i don't know how many pis do i do a fair bit um i have i have three main clinics one's cataract one's glaucoma and one's everything else the, the general and of the 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 glaucoma clinic, I probably do lasers every other week for PIs or iridol or SLT, stuff like that. I hope that just gives you a picture. I can't put specific. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Many. Thank you so much. And there's one, yeah. one last question, if that's okay. You said, yes. Why is it sometimes patients develop ptosis mm. after cataract surgery? Okay, so if you go to this, oh, um, uh, the PXF video, 
Exfoliation. Oh, where's the exfoliation? This one. So the handling of cataract surgery is so, so soft. Same with glaucoma surgery. Your hands have to be solid but soft. <laughs> and can you see here there's a hook and another hook here? Yes. The eyelid is held by these fibers of the levator muscle that insert. If they're already slightly susceptible to age-related totic changes, and you've got this little hook when we put in to expand to get to the eye, if that's not done gently and traumatizes part of the part of the levator muscle, then they can get permanent ptosis changes, basically accelerating their normal age-related ptosis. And, and it has been observed. Um, so a secondary question following that, if that's okay, Sansi. Yeah. Um, if that is the case, if they do end up with this um, totic yeah. lens, yeah. Um, are they suitable to have lid surgery? Yeah. After? Yeah, they can. They can. Sometimes they're so susceptible to it, even on the gentlest touch, the other eyelid drops. You know, most people won't notice if it's a ptosis is symmetrical. People notice differences. That's why the most beautiful people are all totally symmetrical. So if you've got a ptosis in one eye, but then you go on and do, and you go and fix that first, and then you go do the cataract surgery, drop, and you got to fix the other one. Whereas the patient <laughs> might actually be quite happy if they both drop the same. They're more concerned that they look funny than there is one side being dropped. If that makes sense. Yes. So you finish all their internal work first: muscles, squints, cataracts, etc. Finish all the internal work and then fix the eyelids. That's always the last thing to fix because by the time you're fixing lid surgery, and there's underlying anxieties as well. There's an underlying reason why they're upset about that. Dose. And it may be because they're upset the surgeon was rough. And then if you admit, okay, I was really rough or, or it was traumatic or difficult, or if you admit that it was particularly difficult, it, it reassures them. And then they go on, they have the other eye. They have an expectation that they may get a ptosis, and if they don't, then, and they're still unhappy, you lift it up. But it's that um, very frank relationship that you have to develop with the patients, especially when you come to these smaller, smaller print complications. And is it better to, um, in terms of risks from having lid surgery, if the patient decides they do want lid surgery, yeah. um, is it better to wait a certain time span before recommending lid surgery? Yeah, you probably want to wait. Straight away. You, well, just um, the little complications of cataract surgery, like the sort of arc that they see for the lens, the dark arc, or most little things with cataract surgery, or what we call, you know, um, not little, but more the things that do improve over time. The general cutoff is about a year. If the patient can sort of get used to it and live with it, et cetera, and, um, and wait a bit, then at a year, they will either definitively, yes, I want surgery and I want it yesterday, or they'll be like, actually, it's not that much of a problem, or if they've got glasses and they got used to it, or the other lid has drooped, as you had explained, mm. then it's fine. Usually about a year. It may be, well, from a complications and the ability to perform it, point of view, three months is plenty because even the, the tricky cases of chronic inflammation would have settled down. You can start referring at three months post-op and then at about a year, it's a sort of ideal time if there was any adaptation and any um, life circumstances that make them happy and forget about the, the ptosis, that they'll come in and go, yeah, not a problem, it's fine. <laughs> it's acknowledging that it is a problem for them. It's making sure that they know that you're on their side and you're going to make the treatment that's available for them there. That's the main thing. Brilliant. Um, thank you. Those are the only questions on the actual chat that people have written. Yeah. Um, if anyone has any questions, we can uh, email you're me. more than welcome yeah, to email Sensely. Um, I was going to say, I have one question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, the posterior capsule rupture. Mm -hmm. Is at the time of the initial surgery or do you have to call the patient back again? How do you, do you manage that? How do you fix that? So it depends on when it has happened. So if I showed you this, 
And even at this very, very first stage where we first do this, uh, you finish the, the circular opening and you're putting a bit of fluid to rock the lens. If the rupture happens at that stage, bang, and it's gone. And the surgeon is wise enough to realize that there has been a problem, bang, it's gone. Then for the best outcome for the patient, the entire lens is still there and it could drop to the back of the eye and, it, and fishing around would be difficult. Then the eye, the operation is literally stopped at that point and transferred immediately to the retinal surgeons to fix. In places like um, have this uh, VR capacity that happens the same day or the next day when it's kind of very early on and the VR surgeon has to take out the lens. Now if it happens much later on like here, which is why I was emphasizing when, when you polish it and, and when I was emphasizing for the trainees that you gotta make sure You've, you've got to make sure that you pause, make sure that the lens bag doesn't come to you. If that stage touches and you've ripped a little hole, then this, the surgeon, the anterior segment surgeon, has already taken most of the lens out. And there is an ability to very gently, without irrigating, there are techniques to keep the vitreous as far back as possible or to keep the vitreous uh, core in place without pulling on a retina, then the anterior segment surgeon fixes it. So if a PC rupture goes at this stage, or for example, the one with the young man that had the touch, the lens touch, if you have that lens touch and it splits really early on, then might have needed to go to the VR surgeons. But if it wasn't, and I could control it by either converting the wound or just the techniques that we do for advanced cataract surgery, then the anterior segment surgeon actually does it on the day. If a fragment goes, has gone to the back of the eye, almost certainly they go to VR. So the best outcome for the patient is to leave everything, leave the implant, don't put an implant in and go to VR. Because the VR has to take out VR has to take out a fragment. If as soon as there's a fragment that's left behind, the best thing to do is not fiddle the lamp. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Anything else? Just a quick question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, are patients offered what type of implant they want, whether it's multifocal or toric, and can they top up? Top up um, oh, I wish we could do that. Can somebody, can somebody lead on that, please? Because it's just so, oh, it's so frustrating. You know, even one and a half diopter of astigmatism, if you manage to unless it's like the ones I've showed you where it's useful astigmatism, they can read with it. Um, if they have regular astigmatism and it's not corrected, it really affects their quality of life. Unfortunately, for the NHS, we only do um, monofocal, that's it, <laughs> or toric. Okay, we can do torics in some centers. We don't do them at St. Thomas's unless they're part of a clinical research study. So we have a toric IOL implant study, but they have to have regular, regular astigmatism. So we have uh, Professor O'Brat leading on this study with Rayner lenses, celebrating the 70 years of the implant. Um, because each implant is personalized for the toric ones, there's a lot of bench time. It's not just sitting with the patient. If it's rotated, you need to go back and re-rotate it back in multiple surgeries, increase your infection rates, um, you know, and people who don't understand astigmatism properly, just banging in toric implants, don't get good outcomes. Um, you have to have refractive training really to do them properly. Um, but there's no in between. If you want a toric implant and you're not eligible for the trial, you have to go private, at least for and us. And the multifocal, yeah. they can't pay to top they up? Can't, they can't even pay and top it up. Okay, thank you. I think there is a toric, uh, there is a argument for toric top ups. There is multifocal implants are people who want to be spectacle free. It's a refractive consultation. And as you can see already, just from routine cataracts, the number of factors that go in and feed into the conversation, plus the extra anxiety of the need for perfection when they want multifocal implants. And they're not without a, they're not without, um, a downside. 
you know, the halos, the rings, and then people are living to well over 100. You may be a perfect candidate at 55 for multifocal implant and then get AMD and glaucoma at the later stage in life, which we cannot guarantee or predict. Then, then the multifocal implants actually diffract the light or split it up into three. So the intensity that reaches your retina is only 30%. Because 30% is for the distance, 30% is for intermediate, and 30% is for near. And you, you don't always get it spot on for the patient for all three distances, the, the sort of typical multifocal implant. So I guess if people want to be spectacle free, probably the best thing is to do the lens surgery and do corneal refractive, um, refractive correction for um, extended depth of vision, something called press beyond. Um, where you, you sort of split their distance and near ability by correcting their spherical aberrations and take into account their overall wavefront analysis and all that. That's really an expert field and not every cataract surgeon that comes through the training scheme will be able to offer that and well. And even if you've got the patient to do a top up, I think it's so specialized. Maybe, maybe, maybe it will change. Maybe we can get a toric top up fee that will help sustain our NHS a little bit more. At the moment, Thanks. it's mostly monofocal because we look after for the long term, AMD, um, glaucoma, etc. Yeah. Thank you. Good. And who was asking that? Was that, was that uh, Shanaz? Yeah, it was. It's me. Yes. Sure, hello. Oh, your Bye. patient might be coming. I, I might yes, be. I spoke to her June, apparently. She's very happy. Okay. Thank you. Good. Yeah. So last one, it's taken two hours. <laughs> I expect it to be so long, but I guess there's lots of videos and things to show. In the middle, I had a phone call from, uh, from Sanjeev. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank okay. you, Nancy, Just so some... much. These lectures have been brilliant. The feedback okay. has generally been amazing. We, we're Good. very, very grateful. Thank you. Let me um, take this off so I can see. Everyone else still listening. Um, Let me see. Um, I can stop sharing. The end of today's chat. Yes. Um, so that's the end of today. Um, you should show your video so I can see your faces. I don't get to see all of you. <laughs> oh, dear. It's okay. My room is much more untidy. <laughs>